these are not the best examples of affordability, but the XK120 kind of proves this point, which is the race to resume production after the Second World War, because you have very different circumstances in that period. The United States emerges virtually unscathed. Um, they have a massive infrastructure. Um, they get back to production very quickly. Uh, Germany and Italy, of course, are somewhat in tatters, but they have Marshall Fund money to help rebuild their industries. The French are undergoing this, a governmental change where you have a government dictating what private industry is going to build. And then you have the British who are literally starving to death. And oddly enough, even though one of the nominal victors of the Second World War, Britain is in far worse shape than any of the other nations. Um, and Ian, you're probably not old enough, but you might just be. Um, the United States government in, ended um, financial assistance under Lend-Lease without warning to the British government, um, which caught them by surprise. And it just so happened that the winter of 1946 was the worst winter in recorded British history. And so people were literally starving to death. And the British labor government, of course, because having replaced Churchill, said that if you're a British company and you want resources to build products, the only way you're going to do that is if you sell it overseas to earn hard dollars to pay back that debt. Um, and Britain, interestingly enough, is the only country to have paid off its debt uh, in the 2000s um, from an American loan. Because of that, you had all these small British companies um, who had built cars before the war for the home market decide that they were going to start selling cars in the United States. And you had, fortunately, a lot of American servicemen who had been exposed to these strange little contraptions. And the first of these was the MGTC, which is really a pre-war um, MGTB with a slightly widened body. We always think that the, the TC is essentially the exact same car they built before the war, and it really is, except it's built on new tooling. Because all the existing tooling for the TB was destroyed during the Coventry Blitz, because the body tools were held at Bodies Branch in Coventry. So the TC kind of paves the way. It's affordable, it's different. Of course, if you've driven a TC and I say it handles well, you're gonna think I'm lying. But compared to an American car from that era, it actually handled somewhat better. It had passable acceleration of about 26 seconds, zero to 60. Um, 23 if you really pushed. Chances are, if you were a famous race car driver who spoke English in some form in the 1950s or 1960s, you started out in an MG. Phil Hill, Carol Shelby, almost everybody started out in MGs because they were cheap and you could fix them yourself. But the TC paves the way for the XK120, which appears in 1948. During the war in Coventry at Jaguar's headquarters, William Haynes and, and Walter Hassan and William Lyons designed an engine for use after the war that would be known as the XK. And they originally designed it in several forms. Um, there was a four-cylinder version, various six-cylinder versions. But it was designed, of course, to be put into a saloon, which is a sedan, after the war because that earns more money. And when it was delayed and they couldn't get it done in time, they decided they were going to build a sports car with it, which became the XK120. And when it appeared in 1948, it was not only incredibly fast, because the 120 referred to its top speed, it was incredibly cheap. Um, it was affordable, it was stylish, um, it was everything people were looking for in that era, and it really cemented Britain's place um, in the immediate post-war world as a producer of sports cars. This, next to the XK120, is a Jaguar E-Type. It's really a development of the Jaguar D-Type, which was a race car that won at Le Mans in the mid-1950s. All you have to know about the Jaguar E-Type is that Enzo Ferrari called it the prettiest car ever built. It was so popular when it was introduced in Geneva, there was no hope that Jaguar would be able to supply enough to meet the demand. And when a young producer named Cubby Broccoli was going to do a film series starring a secret agent named James Bond, there was only one car that he was going to drive, which is a Jaguar E-Type. And you think to yourself, that's not right, because James Bond doesn't drive an E-Type. James Bond doesn't drive an E-Type 
because Jaguar couldn't spare the three cars. And William Lyon said, we just, we just can't spare the three cars. Um, and so they went to Aston Martin, who was more than happy to supply him with, a vehicle, with three vehicles for the movie. The same situation repeated itself several years later when the Saint television series was being produced for Roger Moore. The producers asked Jaguar for later editions of the E-Type, and they said, we can't spare them, and he got a Volvo 1800 instead. The shape of the E-Type, even though it was styled, was not necessarily styled by a designer because the body shape was the product of a guy named Malcolm Sayer. And Malcolm Sayer, if you asked him, said he was an aerodynamicist. He spent World War II in the Iraqi desert where he shared a tent with a German mathematics professor. You can't make this stuff up, you really can't. Um, the German mathematics professor taught him how to do computer-aided design except the computer hadn't been invented. So he did all of the calculations in longhand, doing point analysis to determine the most efficient shape to achieve a targeted speed. His technique was so advanced that it took Cambridge researchers almost 40 years to recreate the math that he did to do what he accomplished. Rather than just use simple wind tunnel testing, Malcolm Sayer and Jaguar's test driver, a guy named Norman Dewis, would go to Myra, which was the British research facility where they had a test track, and they would stop on the way and buy skeins of wool, and they would cut off little strips of wool and tape them to the car, and they would drive around the track to observe what the wool did. And you would think, well, why can't you do that in a wind tunnel? Because the car under braking and the car under acceleration behaves differently, and they wanted to know every last detail. And so even though this is a really sensual shape, much of it was dictated by aerodynamic form. And of course, you know, to a younger audience, this is Austin Powers' Shagwar. Um, but it is the quintessential British sports car, and it helps usher in a period that we call the swinging 60s. So the E-Type, along with the Mini, really kind of saved Britain again um, almost 20 years after the TC and the 120 had done it by making Britain cool. And you got to remember, during this time, Britain's really struggling. Their empire's gone, their economy is in tatters, um, and the thing that makes them hip again are mini skirts, Birkin bags, and the E-type and the mini. This contrasts really well with this. And it'd be nice to have an earlier example of the 911 or even a 356. It's a shame that many people kind of remember Ferdinand Porsche for Porsche because his career really spans the entire history of the automobile. Um, he was building cars in the very first years of the 20th century. He, of course, was at Mercedes-Benz um, and pioneered you know, several designs um, from the 130 to the 150 to the 170H. He is responsible, of course, for the design of the, the KDF wagon, um, literally the strength through joy car that becomes the Volkswagen Beetle. And the Beetle, of course, bursts the 356, which in turn spawns the 911. As indisputably brilliant as Ferdinand Porsche is, and hopefully no one's armed here, um, <laughs> only a German, as smart as he was, would persist with a design that was so undeniably flawed. The original reason for putting the engine over the rear wheels in the Beetle was safety. They wanted the weight over the driving wheels to provide a solid platform. And remember, the Beetle was designed to be um, a, a mass transportation device for millions of Germans. And that was fine. The problem was, once you turned the Beetle into a sports car in the 356, if you were to ask the most novice designer where is the worst place to put the engine, he would say over the rear axle. Because it's incredibly dangerous. So when you enter a corner too fast in most cars, the way to get yourself out of trouble is to let off the gas. In a rear engine vehicle, if you get into trouble because you've gone too fast in a corner, the only way to save yourself is to go faster and hit the throttle, um, which is very hard for most people to do. 
And if you ever lift the throttle mid-corner in a rear engine car, you will be going off backwards. Rather than fix this and move the engine forward, Porsche spent several decades, almost six of them, until the on onset of electronic aids to fix a design flaw that could have been fixed fairly easy, easily. We can't really remember now, but there was a time in the 1980s when the 911 was obsolete. They were having trouble selling them. Um, Porsche had moved to several front engine designs. Um, and eventually it survives the 924, the 944, the 928, the 968, and becomes cool again. And the one advantage, and if you, if you are kind of in the community and you have seen places like Lufka Colt and Works Reunion and Legends of the Autobahn, and you, my God, these things are everywhere now and the prices are 10 times higher than they ever had been. I think the 911's advantage is it doesn't matter how non-car person you are, you can identify a 911. I drove a nine, I bought a 912, a 67 short wheelbase 912 and drove it from uh, the east coast to the west coast and I was driving through some wheat fields or whatever on I something um, and the sun was on one side of me and I could see my shadow in the wheat and I could tell what that was from the shadow and any 10 year old kid anywhere in the world can go oh that's a Porsche and I think that's what its advantage is and now of course um, they are exceptional machines, and they always have been built exceptionally. They are reliable, their engineering was impeccable, but even Porsche now, you'll notice, um, moves their engines forward um, for the Boxster and the Cayman, um, and even now you'll see them kind of optimally package this basic shape into a far more modern vehicle. When Carroll Shelby decided he wanted to produce his own sports car, he went to his old friend Donald Healy, with whom he had worked in the 1950s during record runs on the Bonneville Salt Flats. Unfortunately, BMC would not allow Shelby to get um, Austin Healy rolling chassis, and so he went to Thames Ditton, where a small company named AC was building the Ace, which itself, if you could see an original Ace side by side to this, the Ace, which was a John Tejero design, is really a copy of essentially a Ferrari 166. Um, straight down to the oval grill, and initially they put in a 260 V8 engine, um, and then a 289, and then a 427, and this example is a 428, which was kind of the ultimate road version. But you kind of see how the British sports car was adapted to become this Anglo-American hybrid, and really a legend. And while all of us lust after the Cobra now, you have to remember that there were new Cobras unsold almost into the 1970s because they were so expensive um, and so difficult to insure and so difficult to keep, uh, to keep maintained. 